Welcome to another moment in the Word. Have you ever felt abandoned, alienated, rejected, alone, and even by those who are close to you? Well, that's precisely what we have here. We're looking now at Matthew. We're looking at chapter 27 and verse 45 and 46. And Jesus is experiencing abandonment. What we find is this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we look at this text, and especially in the Greek, it's very interesting. It, the Greek provides for us some nuance, some detail that really helps to get a little further in our understanding. The first word is not now, but from. Apo is the Greek word, and you say, what's the importance of that preposition? Well, it's actually talking about a position that separates from what was to what is. It's talking about, because of the now, time. It's a separation of time. That's important because because Matthew is not so chronologically concerned. Much of what we found from the beginning in chapter 19, when we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday until, until the, this chapter, we, we find that Matthew isn't so concerned about time. It's then and then and then. But now he's very concerned about time. That's what that oppo is about. That's why this from is so important. It is talking about Matthew focusing on now the precision of time. And what is that precision? Well, we find it's the sixth hour. Well, what is that? Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use Jewish time reckoning. And the time reckoning is from 6 o'clock in the morning. And so if you go the sixth hour from 6 in the morning, you end up with noon. If you were to read this in John's Gospel, you would find that he's using Roman reckoning of time. They begin at midnight, like much of us in the uh, English-speaking world, when we go from midnight. So that's the explanation for why there appears to be a contradiction. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. It just is that we don't understand it when there appears to be a contradiction. So now we find it's from the sixth hour. There's darkness. Well, it's now mid midday. It's noon. It's when the sun is at its peak. And, and there's darkness. That's something that's not right. It's not normal. And darkness, sometimes we like to explain it. Well, now there must have been an, an eclipse that took place. That is where the moon has come between the earth and the sun. Except that doesn't make sense because it's Passover. Passover is when there's a full moon. In other words, the earth is between the moon and the sun. And so consequently, it's not an eclipse. This is something that is quite unusual. It, it is quite unusual because we find darkness was the very first characteristic we find of the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. And there was darkness upon the face of the deep. Darkness was always a part of something that is the absence of light. We find in the third verse of Genesis 1, and God called forth the light. And Zohar, light, that light that is Christ has come into the world. And we find in John 1, verse 5, that the darkness could not comprehend it. It couldn't overcome it. Light always overcomes darkness. But in this particular case, there's darkness, and it's over the entire earth. The word gay that is used there in the Greek is the word we get our English word geology from. And it is referring not to a land, not to a region, not to an area, but instead the entire earth. And we find that that darkness that covered the earth 
is something that God had described would happen in the, in the final days. We find it in the book of Amos, for instance. It's in chapter 8. And it says in verse 11, Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord God, I will send a famine in the land. And verse 12, They will run from, from uh, the sea to sea, from the north even to the east. They will run to and fro. But we look first in the context, and God is talking about the judgment and upon his wrath that will be on the whole earth. He says, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in a clear day. So that this running to and fro, this confusion that takes place is a result of a judgment of God. Oh, by the way, the book of Amos does not end with judgment. It ends with restoration. It ends with the regathering of the nation of Israel back to the land. It ends with promise and blessing upon the whole of the earth. In this particular time, we find judgment, judgment that has come in the form of darkness. But you find in the plagues, the ninth plague was darkness that was over the land. And that comes before the tenth judgment, which is the death of the firstborn. There is a darkness that will be on the face of the earth. That darkness is the absence of light. This is a darkness that has come as a result of the one who is the creator. All creation groans now waiting for the return of Christ. But at this moment, all creation groans. And it is because the one who is the light has been rejected. And that fellowship has now been broken, broken between the creator and his creation. That fellowship that was broken and Jesus being now abandoned. And that abandonment we find even with his disciples, he's not there. They're not there. We find it then with all of those who are in the crowd that walk by who mock him. There's no fellowship there. And with the priest that should have been the ones who were the intercessors between God and man. He's abandoned by them. He's abandoned even by those that are the closest to him that also are being judged. He's abandoned by those. And we have abandoned him. He's all alone. And he will cry out. And he will cry out of this, out of this darkness. He cries out. And what does he cry? Well, it's really interesting, the words that are used here. The word that is used for cry out, this is the only time in the entire Greek New Testament it's ever used. It means to shriek. It means to cry with extremely loud voice. It's also interesting in the Greek, it's in the vocative. The vocative voice is when you cry out and you get attention. It would be much like saying, sir, in English. You're crying out to stranger, perhaps, trying to get their attention. And Jesus is crying out, and he's crying out. And what is he saying? Eli. Or if you're reading it in Mark's gospel, it's Eloi. And what does that mean? Well, the E-L, as you know, is the name for God. Elohim. El is the name for God. Beth El Hem. Bethlehem is the house of God's bread. It, it, it is always interesting. Bethel, the house of God. And so consequently, he's crying out to God. But that little I on the end, Eli or Eloi, that is personal. That means my, my God. In other words, Jesus, even from the cross, is crying out for the fellowship with the Father. The fellowship of feeling abandoned. And it's not a feeling. It's a reality. It's a reality because he's crying out to God. Because, you see, Jesus never called his Father God. He always called him Father. He called him Holy Father. He called him my Father. But he never called him God. Why not? No, oh, because God 
is impersonal. You see, the devils believe in God. That's impersonal. To believe that he is the omnipotent one who has created the heavens and the earth, to believe that he sustains all things, that is good. But that doesn't make a relationship. What Jesus is now testifying to is that he's crying out. It's a testimony of prayer to the Father. But now instead of calling him Father, he's calling him God. Why was that broken? Why was that fellowship? Why the abandonment? Why the alienation? Well, we find that in the book of Psalms. Because this is actually a quote. It's a messianic psalm. It means that it is a psalm that is predicting, that is a prophecy of Messiah. And, and, and the Messiah is Jesus. This is not David talking about himself. This is David prophesying the future. And it begins, my God, my God, this is Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer is found in verse 3, but you are holy. You see, it is not where God forsook his son because the, he had no attention to him. It was because of holiness. You see, Jesus, at this very point, is made sin for us. And being made sin for us, it didn't cause Jesus to lose his deity. No, he's still God. He will later give up his spirit. But at this point, at noontime, for the next three hours, darkness upon the whole earth, this comes as a result of Christ being made sin for us us. Now remember that Jesus had just prayed earlier, John 17, O oh, Father, that they may be one even as we are one. That that oneness, that unity, that fellowship, that intimacy is what Jesus has had with the Father. But at this moment, it's broken. It's broken because you and I have sinned, and sin breaks fellowship. And the only way in which God could reconcile himself is for himself to be made sin for us. And he did it in sending himself, the Lord Jesus, in flesh, who became sin for us, in order that that fellowship might be reunited. So, my dear one, are you abandoned? You will never be abandoned if you know Christ the way he is here. Because you may be abandoned by friends, you may be abandoned by the enemies, you may be, be abandoned by the world, but you will never be abandoned by God. Jesus himself promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And his spirit dwells within you. That is why you know that neither height nor death nor things of present nor things future, nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But here at this point, Jesus experiences that separation. Eloi, Eloi, Lama. The word Lama means purpose. And is translated why. But what is the purpose again? It is not the purpose that Jesus doesn't know. No. Instead, it's the purpose of holiness. You were created to be holy. To be like God. To be one with him. Sabathony. To be abandoned. And that is an interesting word. Because it's a word that is actually the word forsaken. It is a word that is used in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. What does that word mean? That word means to be forsaken at a time of need, in a time when there's distress. And Jesus is crying out, why have you left me? The disciples have left. Everything has now departed. And the Father has departed in fellowship with the Son. The Trinity at this moment 
is out of fellowship for you. When Jesus came into the world, it was at night that there was darkness over the earth, but there was brightness as the angels come and they announce the coming of Christ and the brightness, the effulgence, it, it literally overwhelmed. And it was then the star that led the wise men to then find Jesus. It was brightness that came into the world at Christ's birth. Here, now at his death at high noon, when it's a full moon, when it should have been the all the reasons for for the glory and effulgence and the brightness of the heavens, we now find dark. And that darkness we find in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Remember, there's no mores, seven no mores. The last no more, no more night, no more darkness. In heaven, that fellowship is reunited. There's no abandonment. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for reconciling us to yourself through the blood of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.